Michael Goyette is back. He is a portfolio manager of Terroso Investments and the author of the award-winning Lead Leg Report. The Lead Leg Report uses the lumber to gold ratio to make predictions on where the markets are going. And we'll be touching on this again this time because last time he was on the show, he called for biblical movements and biblical movements we had. This was before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This was before the huge correction in stocks and cryptos that we had early in the year. Michael, welcome back. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. A lot to talk about. All right, a lot to talk about. We'll touch on the lead lag report. We'll touch on any more biblical movements that you've got on the horizon that you can share with us. But first, I want to talk about this uh, very cryptic and ominous tweet that you made a few days ago that I retweeted, actually, on my own account. You said that the next wave lower comes from the housing market. Your home is about to be worth less. Few understand this. I understand what you're trying to say, but the way you phrased it is very ominous. It's like, if if if, if this portfolio manager gig doesn't work out, you should be a Bond villain, you know, make, making threats, <laughs> <laughs> making very credible threats. Um, but I jest. This is a very good, uh, uh, very insightful tweet. Few understand this, you said. All right, so help us understand this. Yeah, so, so a couple of things. There's, um, it's always about time frame with this stuff. And I've been pretty public in making this case that bigger risk off is still yet to come. So let, let's take a step back for a moment. This has been a very, very frustratingly difficult start to a year, not just because stocks have gone down, but because as we know, yields have risen and risen in a very aggressive way. In my world, when it comes to my funds, Roro, Jojo, ATAX, everything that I do is really around trying to get that treasury trade, that convexity trade where when you have a correction, stocks go down, historically money flows into long duration treasuries, you make money in bonds as stocks fall. This year, you haven't seen any of that. Right? So you've had a very unusual correction in that everything has correlated in the same way on the downside. Now, what does that have to do with housing? Most major crashes, corrections in bear markets are preceded by weakness in housing, full stop. You can look at that economically. You can look at that based on the behavior of lumber. Usually, housing is the big precursor to a major volatility tail event in equities. And yet you've already had a big decline and housing has not preceded that big decline in risk assets. As yields have spiked here, I suspect you're going to start to see a pretty meaningful slowdown in demand for housing. We know there's still significant supply issues. I suspect these prices are going to have to come down pretty aggressively. But I go back to how I started this, this conversation until about time frame. The, the counter to the argument that, that you're going to have an immediate decline in housing prices is... I'm pretty sure that with gas prices as elevated as they are, with wheat prices, oil, you're going to see more and more people want to work from home again because it's going to be cheaper than actually filling up your gas tank and going to work when your employer is saying to come into the office. So you have these kind of, I think, counteracting trends or counteracting forces in the short term. But yes, I do think that if you're going to go with the argument that there's, there's another wave lower, it has to come from weakness in housing. And we know housing is wildly unaffordable now. Well, hold on. So, so, sorry, just just on that point of, uh, I'm just trying to understand your logic. So even if my employer wants me to go to work at the office and I say, no, I'm staying at home, how is that going to affect demand for housing? I mean, even if I go to the office, I still need a roof under over my head. Sure. I still need to stay there. It's not like, yeah, I'm spending more time at home, but I, I've already bought the place, right? How does that how does that translate to demand? Yeah, no, that's fair. But I think at the margin, you'll have more of that sort of moving away from cities into suburban okay. areas and, and things like that. Check this out. U.S. mortgage rates cross 4% again. All right, that's the, that's the highest it's been since uh, 2018. Uh, does that have anything to do with your analysis? It's always about the speed. I always go back to it's not really about level. It's the speed with which things act, right? Whenever you, I, I, I had this tweet out a week or two ago. I said, you know, inflationary shocks are deflationary because it has to do with the speed with which things move, with the inability to react off of that. And that actually causes margin compression, causes all kinds of slowdowns, contractionary effects. So my argument would be that because of the way that yields have spiked, that that is probably going to be a real reason for housing demand to cool, prices to go down. But again, I'm going to counter that only in the short term because that shock in mortgage rates also is resulting in a shock in oil, shock in wheat. And at the margin, that still probably keeps some people at home. So it's not that I'm trying to play both sides of it. What I'm arguing is that there is a, a counter argument for why the housing bull run can continue, but that next wave lower has to come from lumber as a preceding indicator. Okay. Uh, 
couple of follow-up questions. When you talk about the housing markets, which markets in particular are you referring to, or is it all across America? We have a broad, very broad uh, geographic uh, diversity. So just because New York isn't doing well, it doesn't mean Atlanta won't do well. It doesn't mean the smaller cities where people are moving towards can't do well, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a valid point. So I think what you're going to see is probably more of a rebalance where some of the hot areas come down and some of the other areas come back up. Keep in mind also when it comes to housing, to your point, that part of the consideration is what uh, states are going to be doing in terms of real estate taxes, right? Because we know all these states are in bad shape and those that have better, better finances will probably still have a better housing market than others because they're not going to, you know, people will move to those areas where taxes are likely to stay lower, right? So you're absolutely right. But I think it's kind of a broader nationwide issue. The entire housing move has been driven by incredibly low rates and the Fed supporting the housing market. The Fed now is telling us very clearly they want to really aggressively fight inflation. That means they're going to have to keep on aggressively spiking rates conceivably. And that at the end of the day is going to cause a slowdown in demand. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that we don't know exactly when this will happen, but how bad could it get? Last time we had a housing crisis was 2008. Could it be as bad as then? No, I mean, you have other factors there, right? Because obviously you had financialization and, and spreading of risks and, and, and things like that that ended up causing the great financial crisis. Um, Level-wise, I don't know, but I suspect you're going to have something that at the margin could be pretty substantial. Because again, I go back to, we know that real incomes have actually worsened in this. People are actually making less after inflation, and certainly relative to, to housing, that's the case. So in order for things to come back in line, you have to see these prices come down. You have to see demand start to, to wane on this. Yeah. Well, so a couple of things could happen. We could have mortgage rates keep going up, and in which case some people might have to uh, sell off their investment properties or worst case default. Uh, like you mentioned, when inflation kicks in and uh, people's real wages aren't going up, they may have to default anyway because uh, their, 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 their variables are just going to be uh, unaffordable, assuming they do have variables and not fixed. Now, what's the most likely outcome here? Are people going to be okay for the time being? Um, or are people going to be over-levered like they were last time and uh, we're going to have mass defaults across the board and uh, a systemic shock in housing is going to happen? So it's funny you mentioned the... Uh the biblical terminology, and I'll, I'll relate it to that for a second. So first of all, when I was last on Kiko, I was talking about how markets be biblical from the standpoint of mean reversion, right? He was first should be last and last first. And as I thought about it, that as Russia, Ukraine started playing out and these food prices started spiking, which by the way, the average American ha hasn't seen that in a grocery bill just yet. That's still coming. Um, we do have this kind of another sort of argument for a biblical environment, right? First you had pestilence, COVID. Uh, now you got war with Russia, Ukraine, who knows about China, Taiwan, by the way. Yeah. And then famine, famine is next, right, with food prices. Now, how does that relate to housing? Because, and I hope it doesn't get to this, be this bad. I don't think it will, but you never know. I mean, again, we're in an environment where extremes ha ha happen. If food prices get to be really out of control, it's going to be a very simple question for most Americans. Uh, do you pay your uh, uh, interest bill? Do you pay your mortgage payment? Or do you pay for milk? I know that sounds dramatic, but when you have this kind of environment where things are spiking like this, that can become a very serious consideration for most people. And that also at the margin can also impact housing. Famine is next. Whoa. Okay, let's not skip over that. Let, let's elaborate on that point. Okay, I know food prices are going up. They have been for a long time, the last two years. I know agriculture uh, commodities, wheat, uh, soybeans, so the soft commodities have gone up a lot, mo mostly as a result of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, why are we getting a famine, though? That, that's, that seems like a big jump from increasing, increasing food prices to a famine. Well, because at the end of the day, who's going to get most affected by it? It's going to be the emerging economies and those that simply don't have enough income. People forget that the Arab Spring was largely driven by wheat prices, right, and discontent over that. Look, the, 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 the famine point is, is important here because, again, I go back to I don't think most people have any clue how bad grocery prices could end up getting. Keep in mind, when we're talking about wheat, soybeans, and, and various crops, you're talking about supply from the last growing season, which was last year, we actually don't know what the real supply is going to look like, even though prices have already skyrocketed right on the on the old supply. Now, play it out. Let's say Russia, Ukraine ends up worsening. Let's say you have more nationalization of resources and you end up having more countries like we've seen saying they're going to ban exports of wheat and other key uh, food commodities. OK, and then let's say you happen to have a bad weather uh, scenario. Well, sure, you could have a massive, massive supply shock. 
And if that happens, prices will skyrocket. And again, you're going to see a lot of people, I think, literally being forced to tighten their belt, unfortunately. Yeah, don't forget fertilizers as well. Russia is a big supplier. Fertilizer is a big one. That's right. That's yeah, right. Russia is a big supplier of fertilizers. That might get cut off, and that's going to have huge global uh, 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 ripple implications. Okay. Now you're talking and, and about. Like, and I will say real quick on that. You know, people, people, I think culturally people forget that these things take time to actually flow through into the economy. Right? We're used to this sort of on-demand way of looking at the world, but the reality is you can't just suddenly overnight grow double your crop. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. Yeah, but you're talking about people in the emerging markets being affected the most. I agree with you, and it's unfortunate that they're in their circumstance, but let, let's bring it back home. Are people in America, Canada, and the G7, are they going to experience this famine? I mean, I know that maybe food prices are going to go up. That just means my discretionary income. Well, not not sure. technically not discretionary, but my discretionary spending power is going to go down after my food bill. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to starve or I don't know how. No, no, no. That's her point. I'm not trying to be overly dramatic with that terminology. Right. But if you, you know, if you think about a single mother that's in another country with five kids and suddenly now food prices have gone up 40, 50 percent. I mean, that seems like a recipe for famine. OK, so first we had a plague. Now we have gore. <laughs> Famine is next. Housing markets are gonna are, are gonna are gonna fall. What's gonna happen after that, in relation to the stock markets? Yeah. So, and this goes to why I keep saying on Twitter that this market has been a complete and utter shit show. Um, and I say that from the standpoint of somebody who's got skin in the game, running three funds. And listen, my my three funds have not really done all that well this year. Certainly not Roro. Given that lumber to gold has been strong in the advance, I go back to this has been an exception of an environment, not not the rule. Even though all the testing shows that again, lumber to gold tends to get ahead of major corrections, crashes it hasn't been the case this time, uh, and only now are some leading indicators saying risk off is still coming, which is a really really strange dynamic. Everything's kind of desynced in this environment. So what happens to markets? Look, the thing about volatility is that it works both ways, and the thing about bear markets is that you have these five, ten, fifteen, twenty percent rips before ultimately making lower lows. You know, we, we've seen some pretty aggressive moves, for example, in the China market where these stocks collapse and then suddenly go up 30, 40%, and everyone thinks the bottom is in, but that's characteristic of bear markets. So I think the, the way to think about equities here in general is we are in a really, really dangerous environment, really, really dangerous environment, because as and I keep going back to this point, it's dangerous for both bulls and bears. We've talked about this before. The challenge is you can make a very bleak, bearish argument, the famine argument that I just made. You can also make a very, very bullish argument, which is that everyone is so wildly negative, just like they were in March 2020. So you have, on the one hand, sort of a, a perfect bear case for further clients. You also have the perfect contrarian case. And that's why I keep going back to this point that I believe an extreme is coming. I have absolutely no goddamn clue which way it's going to play out. I just know it's going to be very, very difficult where just a couple of weeks could make the year. Okay. So you've You've alerted us of this danger, of this imminent threat. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. We don't know exactly how bad it could be. You don't know how exactly it's going to play out. Nobody does. Well, uh, as Churchill uh, once said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So how are you yeah. planning and preparing for this imminent correction? And as Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> right. So, so I think I think it's a valid point what you're saying there. OK, so so. What does that mean in practice? Now, I'm running tactical funds. I'm going to have times when I'm desynced, like I am, unfortunately, now, and times when I'm resynced, like when my mutual fund in 2020 was up 72%. I, I think for most individual investors, the key thing is you've got to reset your expectations and don't think you know what's going to happen next. I just put on this tweet. It's like, think about, David, You know, back in, in January of 2021, how everyone was so excited about GameStop. It was at 480 back then. Now it's 81, despite all this analysis, all this talk. I'm only using that as an example to make this point that nobody knows what tomorrow brings. You cannot be overly convinced of any particular thesis. All that means, and I know this is cliche, I'm sure a lot of comments on the YouTube channel are going to say, well, you know, that's a very obvious answer is diversify. But I go back to diversification does not mean having 500 stocks, does not mean having high yield. It means having a mix of things that tend to dance at different times during the song. Yeah, Gold is a part of that. Bitcoin, I would argue, is also a part of that. Uh, all these other areas, which 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 are trying try to have different kind of drawdown uh, timing uh, issues, meaning some area goes through a drawdown and then another one goes later on. That's how you ultimately have a more robust portfolio. 
Okay, so uh, we've covered investments. Practical life budgeting advice. Then should I be selling my home right now? Should I stockpile in canned foods? Uh, what should I do? Yeah, you know, it's funny. On, on, on Twitter, I get people sending me pictures of bags of wheat that they're literally <laughs> buying up. And I know that sounds crazy, but I have to tell you, you know, look, I tend to be a little bit of a, a paranoid individual in general. Right? It kind of goes to the Intel CEO uh, line. Only the paranoid survive. In January of 2020, I was one of those guys that bought a whole bunch of N95s, right? Because I, I saw things that were happening in China. It seemed like people were underreacting to it. And then COVID hits, right? And okay, with hindsight, fine. It was, it was, it was okay. But I have a similar kind of feeling today about food prices. Now, I myself have stocked up a little bit on some non-perishable or kind of longer dated uh, perishable food items. Stay, but just in case, because I view that as saving, not because I'm concerned that I'm not going to find them in the on the shelves, but just because I do believe prices are going to go up far faster and far more aggressive than most realize. And then if other people start to realize that, that's what creates the hoarding, it creates the self-fulfilling cycle of higher prices, right? So practically speaking, I don't think it's a function of selling your home or or getting ultra, ultra panicked here, but you've got to be very careful about how you're spending your money because it is going to be a lot harder for the things that we need. Dire, ominous warnings indeed. Well, like I said, if this portfolio manager gig doesn't work out, Bond villain is uh, possibly a, a good career option for you. But um, a good prognosticator you are nonetheless. You've called the last corrections correctly and the ones before that for crypto. So I commend you for uh, sticking your neck out there and making these calls. We'll follow up again soon and talk about market action. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I highly recommend getting a bunch of cereal, David. <laughs> Get a bunch of cereal. That's what you should be doing. I hate cereal, but yes, I will follow your advice. Thank you for Breakfast watching. Breakfast of Champions. Breakfast Bre of Champions. I like um, Chef Boyardee, so I don't know if they'll still have those. Breakfast? Um, um, yeah, I mean, breakfast is just the first meal of the day. It doesn't, it doesn't, I'm not constrained by the, the type of food. It's just when I wake up, I eat whatever's in the fridge. <laughs> uh, this is why you and I are friends. <laughs> All right, thank you, Michael. We'll talk again soon. Thank you for watching Kitco News. Stay tuned.